Oi, tudo bem? Sejam muito bem-vindos ao Cultura de Excelência. Eu sou a Karen Ross e um prazer receber vocês aqui. Aqui na Voito teremos encontros semanais onde vamos conversar com mulheres de todo o mundo sobre propósito, melhora de processos e gentileza. Hi everyone, how are you? I'm Karen Ross and it's a pleasure to welcome you here. Here at Voito, we'll be having weekly meetings where we talk with women from around the world about purpose, process improvement, and kindness. And before we get started with today's absolutely fabulous episode, I just want to remind everybody to download the handbook that's going to give you information about all of our episodes, insights from past episodes, what's coming up. You don't want to miss it, so just use the QR code that you see right here on the screen and download your handbook to get started today. We have a super exciting topic. We're going to talk about emprendedorismo femenino, como trazar meu proprio camino no lean, female entrepreneurship, how to chart your own course in lean. And we have a fabulous guest today that I'm super, super happy to welcome, my good friend, Karen Martin, who is a global consulting firm founder of TKMG. And she also has a second business related TKMG Academy, which is her online learning arm. So I can't think of a better person to talk to us about owning their own business from the women in lean perspective than Karen Martin. So I'm super excited to welcome Karen to the show today. Hi, Karen. Thank you so much for having me. And hello, everyone. Hola. I'm so excited you're here. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about Takey T? Oh my goodness, TKMG and all of the exciting work you do in the consulting portion and on the online learning? Will do. Thank you. And you know, one way to kind of remember it is it used to be the Karen Martin group. And then we decided to take me out of the limelight as I'm building a team. And so that's why we decided to call it TKMG and TKMG Academy. So I started building operations and managing and improving operations internal many, many, many years ago. And it was rapid growth and it was a little crazy and chaotic. But I studied Deming and I learned a lot about total quality management, TQM, and um, applied that in the operations. And, and, you know, I was told by my leaders and other customers groups and um, other suppliers that we had a really well oiled machine. It was very smooth operations, high service quality and things like that. So I decided I wanted to teach it to everybody and spread what I had learned over the years and making a few mistakes also. And um, I started the company, the consulting arm in 1993. So we've been at it 28 years, which is just boggles my mind. We work with industries, all, all kinds of industries, government, not for profit, every single industry there is we've worked in. And so I get a chance to really see all the common patterns and then all of the nuance and differences in lots and lots of different organizations, both culturally and in how they deliver their services or, or goods to customers. So I decided, because I also have a master's in adult learning, I wanted to do more teaching of the basic concepts because there are a number of, of organizations out there that when you go in and look at their content about operational excellence, it's kind of superficial and it doesn't get into the psychology of the work we do, which I'm really into. And so I decided to start the academy and we launched literally two weeks after COVID hit. And uh, we weren't, we were going to pull back and, and not launch, but we decided, ah, we're going to do it. COVID will be here for a month. Huh? Um, and so, <laughs> um, and so, but, but it's been, it's been finally getting a lot of traction. I think businesses are starting to spend money again. And so it's very exciting. And uh, we're putting together a new course every four to eight weeks, depending and launch it. And just um, very happy to be bringing what we've experienced for so many years to the world. Well, you are really a pioneer in 
being a woman business owner, <laughs> a woman in lean business owner. So I have some super fabulous questions to ask you about that. And I know that the every everyone, women and or, or men who are watching are really going to gain some wonderful insight. And especially, you know, starting a second business during COVID is something really challenging. So if you don't mind, can you tell us a little a bit more about that journey of entrepreneurship, how you started to launch your business and really a little bit more about what motivated you and inspired you to do so. And really it makes me think back to my chat. The very first episode with Katie Anderson is about purpose. Mm. And so every journey with purpose. And just from your little introduction, I can feel that purpose coming through. Yeah, so I have I have lots of different ways to explain what drives me, but it all drills down to this. Work doesn't have to be as hard as we make it. And work should be a time, frankly, of spiritual renewal. You know, there's a lot we can grow as human beings, and we have to have the right work environment to allow that growth to occur, the right resources and support and learning and development available and all of that. But that is fundamentally, I just think that, <clears throat> excuse me, we should go to work <clears throat> and be able to be our best. And and lots of times um, cultures are developed that um, actually get people working kind of at their worst. And um, so I don't like that. Um, the other thing is, is that as far as the entrepreneurship part of it, when I started the consulting firm, yes, I had an entrepreneurial um, kind of muscle or, or interest. My dad owned his own business. My mom was in business and I had started in science. And so I was completely different from the business world. And um, it was more though out of uh, not duress, but I was internal and corporate and I was just getting burned out and I wanted to spread what I knew. So I one day actually re refused a, pro a um, promotion to vice president, resigned and started my consulting firm that day. <laughs> so, and I wasn't prepared. <laughs> so, so that was, that was the consulting side of things. The Academy was very intentional and very purposeful from the beginning to spread this knowledge across the globe. And we have learners in 37 countries now. Um, so I'm very excited about that. And it's been a challenge. You know, it's, it's hard to launch and, and you have a few people knocking on the door for your services and then you go, ah, now what? Is it that they don't like the service? You know, and having confidence, I think, is such a big and faith. You know, you have to go into entrepreneurship knowing there are going to be really rough times. And you have to just believe in yourself and believe in your mission and be smart. I mean, you can't just have faith. You have to have, you know, wherewithal and funds and things like that. But um, it's, it's hard to not wonder every once in a while, like, is anyone going to come to party? You know, <laughs> they do what they do. It's so interesting that you say that also about your family background, because, of course, I started my own business, you know, not as long ago as you are. But my family, no one is an entrepreneur. So that idea they're all academics so that idea that someone is going to own a business was very uh scary to them and very unknown and i didn't you know other than working with businesses that in my own family wasn't a background so i think the advice really that you have to have faith in yourself and confidence in yourself and understand just like working in an organization, nothing is going to be perfect owning your own business, but you have to have that confidence in your purpose mm -hmm. and in yourself. So I totally, totally agree with you. So I think when we look at the community of women in lean, although many of them are starting to own their own businesses now, in the past, we've seen so many men who are business owners, not just in lean, but, uh, you know, in all different kinds of organizations. And I think it makes many women afraid of entrepreneurship. How can we, how can we settle our own fears? You've already talked a little bit about that, right? Nobody is knocking on the door. How do you settle your fears? Hmm, that's a really good question. So I think the first thing is, well, why shouldn't we be the ones owning businesses? And why shouldn't we be, you know, starting to get more and more of the feminine energy into business and balance out what has been traditionally a very masculine energy in business? Like, why shouldn't we? And um, so I think that's the first thing. But also, I think that 
women, I mean, I actually like to talk about gender differences. I know sometimes people feel like that's stereotypical, but I think that there are differences. There are exceptions, of course, always. But, you know, I think women, for example, are challenged in entrepreneurship with charging enough. You know, just asking for the same amount of money a man would ask for generally. I, I'm generalizing. Um, but I think that's something that most women have to battle is getting over that hump of believing that they're lesser than or they're not worth the value that, that others are getting, men are getting. So I think that's a re really important one. And then the other thing is building credibility. So I, I think, you know, what, what happens is confidence breeds competence and competence gets results. And so what you have to do is when you're starting to work with whatever your customer base is going to be, you know, you have to be, you have to do your homework. You have to be prepared. You have to know your stuff and you, you have to anticipate questions, even if they're never asked and things like that so that you have competence without arrogance. And um, I think that's really important to know your stuff. So when you feel yourself feeling afraid, what do you do? Do you talk to yourself and say, Karen, there's nothing to be afraid of? Do you reach out to other people? Because, you know, as an entrepreneur, I also understand that sometimes it can be lonely. You don't necessarily work with a team. You don't necessarily, you know, have someone like in a corporate office and all the responsibility falls on you. So. I tend to either reach out to a friend and chat with a friend about my idea or I write down my fears or draw a picture. Do you have anything special that you do? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I think I do a little of everything. So my brother is in business, and so I talk a lot with him. He and I are very close, and he's always the voice of reason. So that that's good. I have a really tight and large group of very core friends, and people say, who's your best friend? I'm like, oh, I've got five. Um, and so, so they're a big uh, part of my support system. But I also have a lot of paid coaches in my life. I, I very much believe in coaching. And so you know, I've got one guy that's a business development expert that and I've got one guy that's a client proposal expert and I've got one woman that's a marketing expert and you know I I I pay them and I learn tons from them so I do think that you have to surround yourself with with paid coaches as well as free advice I think that's totally great advice and of course you've been so kind as to start at table and women in lean also for entrepreneurs so we have a lot of support from other people but it's definitely something that i've also found is we can't like go it alone right right <laughs> but, so one thing about women in lean that has surprised me like I, I i didn't know what to expect when i joined women in lean and it has been so generous and so for example that one of the tables well the table that i co-lead with marie um Pacla, genevieve Pacla, i don't know how to say her last name um <laughs> <laughs> we had a session where people were asking about contract con contractors and client um, contractual agreements and terms with contractors. And so we created a Google Drive and we all put our sample contracts. So we're sharing our contracts with each other. And another one asked for the way that people price and someone put their pricing model into this Google Drive. And so people are very generous and it, it's really helpful when you get all these different perspectives on how to do something, it's, it's wonderful. I love women in labor. <laughs> I love it too. And I think a great thing about that back to your, um, you know, uh, point about gender differences. I think that this is also one that less focused on competition. We're focused on collaboration and cooperation and helping each other. And I understand that if I help you or Katie Anderson helps me or we help other people actually, there's enough business to go around for all of us and that helping each other is really just going to make us stronger as well. Yes. Thank you for developing Women in Lean. <laughs> you are very welcome. So here's a really fabulous question and it really goes back to what you were saying again about part of your motivation and your background in uh, uh, organizational development is how can people make their own business as entrepreneurs, their own business, an environment where people feel safe to share ideas and solve problems. And how can kindness to self and others help with this? Because as lean consultants, oftentimes 
were working on that with other people in their own business. As business owners, we need to apply those same things to our own business. Yes. So I'll share a, a, a kind of an embarrassing story, but it's true. When I was only 26, I had my first direct report, you know, an employee that I was responsible for. And um, I back then I had the, the, the know-it-all syndrome. Uh, I was a star performer and I was very competent. And so I, you know, didn't know how to develop others. I didn't know how to delegate. I, I, I was an awful supervisor, awful. And, um, and I didn't do well in supervisory roles. And then when, once I became a director, I was climbing up. I went and got a lot of coaching and, and took courses. I got better at it. But then I had a whole period with no employees. When I started the consulting firm, it was just me hanging a shingle. And then I developed a contractor pool, but they're not, it's different. They're not employees. And the, the whole way that you engage with a contractor versus an employee is, is different. I don't know whether it should be, but for me it is. And so it's not until the academy that I now have three actual employees and then on the on the other side, like 15 contractors and the employee, you know, this was my first opportunity to actually apply lean because I learned lean after I was internal. And um, and so now I'm like, oh, my, I get to practice what I preach. Can I do it? And you'd have to interview the employee, my employees to see, you know, whether the team, you know, whether they uh, feel like I'm doing a good job practicing what I preach. Um, but I think so. So one of the things, for example, that I've always bristled against is annual reviews. So we have one on one. I have one on ones with every single team member every single week and sometimes daily. I have I have one employee that I have a daily one on one with. Now, you can't have 14 direct reports and, you know, and and be able to do that, which is why Toyota so masterfully has about six direct reports per leader because they're coaching them. They're developing them. And I'm I'm learning every step along the way with my employees. What's getting them excited? What aspects of work are frustrating that they'd like to see go away, if if any? You know, what do they want more development in? What are they like? Please just don't ask me to ever do that again because I don't feel like it's my sweet spot. And we shift work around based on interest and passion for the work. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but anyway, you're absolutely answering my question, and. I think that, you know, single piece flow for coaching and developing, you've learned a lot about coaching from having coaches, right? And also from the lean process and also batching and waiting is a waste. Why would we actually batch uh, reviews for one year or six months? Who came up with that? <laughs> Who came up with it? It's the silliest model I've ever seen. And it doesn't give people a chance to do any PDSA, to, to change their behavior. You know, if we help them with something, they try it tomorrow and come back and we give them feedback. It's going to be just so much better for all of us. Yeah, you get real-time growth. You know, if you wait till one once a year, even once a quarter, that's too long. You know, you want to get the growth and get the person excited and, you know, it's, it's, hum it's being humane. Yes, and think how unkind it is. It's to very unkind. Your annual review and find out someone's been unhappy with your work for the whole for the whole year. Do yep. you use since it's COVID? Um, do you use any kind of visual management or remote visual management with your employees? We have a couple different uh, Google Sheets we use primarily to manage the work. Now, as far as priorities, that's what we we use. You know, Google Sheets to manage priorities. Um, each project kind of has its own its own way, and we were we've always been virtual, so we didn't have any adjustment at all to make on that front. It was more on the client side. I was used to doing in-person work and, and moving that to virtual took a little adjustment. But um, as far as the business goes, we've always been all home based all over the country. Um, and so yeah, our huddles are at 1030 in the morning, my time, which I'd prefer them to be earlier. But we have two West Coast people. So our, <laughs> huddle, you know, our huddles are at 830 their time. Yes, absolutely. Well, I've you know been entirely virtual since I started my business as well. So I think that's really interesting. And maybe, uh, you know, as women, we are willing to try something different and more innovative and, you know, think about how that affects other people too. So 
I know that there's lots of women who are watching and lots of women uh, who want to start their own business. It's going on in the back of their mind. So, and some of them, you know, they have their own take on continuous improvement, their own way that they want to run their business. What advice do you have to women who just want to get started and take that leap into entrepreneurship? Yeah, good question. So first of all, I want to talk about money again for a moment. So I have a best, one of my best friends um, is right now wanting to go out on her own. And she's wanted to go out on her own, honestly, for 20 years. And she hasn't done it. And I've been trying to kind of, you know, push her a little bit, but like give her a lot of space. And she's primarily afraid of money. She's afraid that she won't earn money. She's getting near, you know, getting closer to retirement. And um, she's just afraid she's not going to be able to make ends meet. And I do think it's important to have savings. I did not, but that was pretty, pretty, you know, silly to not have really, really thick savings. I was, you know, I forget what I, how old I was, early 30s, I think. And I had gone through a divorce, so I didn't have much money. Um, but I did it anyway and I survived. And so, you know, I think you have to balance that fear of, of will I earn enough with just do it because when you're trying to split your attention between developing something new that you really want to do and still being internal somewhere, you can't focus all of your attention. So you're never going to get all the benefits of focus, you know, that you can get once you're completely free. But I'm not suggesting you be irresponsible and just dive out there and pray that money comes, you know? <laughs> so I get the, I get the, the need for it. But the other thing would be is to really dig, dig deep into your core on what's special and unique about how you think about the world and operational excellence and what's, you know, what's really unique about what makes you you. How are you different from the next person that might be developing some sort of lean or continuous improvement entrepreneur um, entity? What, like what's different? And really play on that. And it takes a while sometimes to figure out what that is. Ask others what that is. Others that know you may see things that you don't even see that makes you unique. Um, so being clear and playing on that, I think is a really good, a good step. I totally agree with you. And I think it's so important that idea of be yourself because the reason people are going to hire you is for you. Otherwise <laughs> they would hire someone else. And I'm in total agreement. Just a quick story. When I was thinking about starting Karen Ross consulting, I signed up for a business mentoring program through the government here and I talked to some, you know, older gentleman who was retired from owning his own business. And when I told him my idea of what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it, he said, that is the stupidest thing I ever heard. Nobody will ever hire you. You will never be able to have a business. And it actually took me three years to I didn't even know the person, but to overcome that voice in my head saying that the way I wanted to do something in my idea wasn't good. And actually three years later, I developed the confidence and really the sense of purpose because I really didn't want to continue to do what I was doing. It didn't go with my integrity and that helped me to make, make that leap. And just like you said, I'd save some money. And people said to me, well, if your business doesn't work out or you don't like it, what will you do? Won't you feel like a failure? I said, I won't feel like a failure. How will I know if right. something is for me <laughs> unless I do it and I do it in my own way? And of course, there's been hard times. There's been easy times, but I kept going and it's totally fine. Well, you know, I had a similar story. My CEO that I reported to at the time when I resigned said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, consulting, you know, just because I wanted to give advice and help people do what I knew how to do. It seemed like the logical place. And he said, you're going to hate consulting. And I said, why? He goes, because you like to control too much and you'll have no control as a consultant. And, you know, in retrospect, the first two years, he was right. I, it was really hard for me to take, like I call it leading the horse to water, but then having the horse not drink, you know, like getting people to the point where they could be successful, but then they wouldn't actually do the work and do the practice to become successful. And that, that was really hard for me and I couldn't control it. But then I finally got the liberation in that. You know, I, I, I got the freedom of, look, I'm the teacher coach. And, you know, if the student doesn't want to learn, then, you know, I need to move on. And um, it's been really liberating. And he and I just reconnected after 28 years of not talking. And I said, remember when you told me that I would hate consulting? And he said, yeah. 
I said, I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. Can't imagine doing anything else. So. I, I, and I'm so glad that you didn't listen to that voice. And I didn't listen to the voice that told me I couldn't do it. And I think really it takes us back to purpose and confidence in your own voice and in giving something to try your own way. We are never going to know what happens until we try something out. Yeah. And I would, last thing I would say is, you know, it's important to want to do the work and not be doing it for money. The money will come. And if you're if you're if you're being authentic and if you're differentiating yourself and if you're you know being responsible to clients and customers, um, the money will come. Absolutely. So now I know you have uh, your own students and how important having students at your uh, academy is. So we're going to take some questions from Voito students that uh, they put together for us. Okay. Um, they're actually fabulous questions. So since you started on your entrepreneurship journey, what mistakes did you make and what did you learn? Well, the first mistake was not having any savings to speak of um, and, and the fear that that would. But it also was fear was a motivator for me also. You know, I was like, I don't have a big savings account. Um, again, I had just come off of a divorce where I, I didn't really take what I should have taken. Um, and so it was a motivator. So I think, you know, having some financial pad will allow you more freedom to take your time developing your product and, and getting to market. Um, so that, that's a good one. That was a kind of a mistake. Um, I think the other mistake in the, on the consulting side of things is believing that people understand things like excellence and continuous improvement more than they do. And, and it took me a long time to figure out how to get people excited about it, even if they opened the conversation being fearful of it. And so I think we have to make sure we understand. I mean, always know thy audience, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it took me a, quite a few years to understand that what I found like, well, why would you not? And this is like in my I was born making checklists, you know, as a kid. <laughs> and so. You know, I, I didn't understand how, how unique that was. And so I think getting really clear about the mind of your customer and how you need to educate them. It's not just selling. I mean, selling is education, really. Um, and so you have to educate them a lot. I did decide, you know, several years back not to ever need to sell lean again to a client. So I won't take a client if they don't, if they don't even know what lean is. I'm not going to do that kind of sale. They need to already be excited about it to some degree or some one person on the team, at least in the leadership team needs to be excited by it and have some experience with it before I'll work with them now. But when you begin, you have to take other clients. Like you have to take not everything that comes in the door, but a lot of what comes in the door, because that's where you learn through the diversity of clients. Absolutely. And I love it that actually you've gone back to the basic principle of Toyota Way, which is customer first, right? Mm -hmm. Understand, deeply understand the needs of each of each of your customers. So, and still, Mistakes happen, and guess what? Yep. Eight years. <laughs> you, know, learn. you don't learn when things are going really, really well. Exactly. So what tips would you give to someone who's starting a business to find a great mentor and just think, you know, one of the mistakes I made was just choosing a mentor because here was a program and it actually, you know, didn't give me confidence. It, it, it had the opposite effect. Right. Uh, well, I think Women in Lean is an amazing place to start. Um, I've never had the time to do much mentoring, but I did just start mentoring one person that I met through Women in Lean. And, um, and it was, <coughs> it's very infrequent, but, um, but it's, it's been a really fun experience. I learned a lot through it as well. Um, how do you find a mentor? I mean, I use referral services a lot. So I'll ask around. I, I don't like to just take people blindly because I want someone I'm going to click with and then interview them. You know, don't accept a mentorship with anyone or, or even, you know, you know, even if it's a casual coaching relationship or if it's paid, especially interview them, learn how they react to ideas that maybe they do think are silly instead of saying like, they, like your poor, your, your poor thing, like that guy saying, oh, that's a terrible idea like that. You don't want to hear that. You want to hear maybe what kinds of questions uh, you should be entertaining to evaluate the idea on your own, but you don't want a coach saying it's a terrible idea. So I would interview people. Um, 
And then I also would never be afraid to just pick up the phone or put keyboard fingers on keyboard and reach out to someone who you just admire and you've read their work and you never know. I mean, people do like to give back. A lot of people like to give back. And um, so I, I would just use that as your guide as well. I think that's a fabulous, uh, fabulous bit of advice. And I have done that number of times, just reached out to someone who I admired and people really are truly generous. Mm -hmm. They are. Yep. I love that. All right. Last question from the fabulous Voito students. What tips would you give for women who, um, when they're going through a hard time in their business, and I'm not going to say if, because it's not <laughs> it's when, when you're going through a hard time, when you're going through a slow time, what do you do to keep going? So first of all, I've always been a, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade kind of gal. And so I, it's scary. I'm not going to kid you. Like there are times in the beginning of COVID, I was terrified. I have payroll. I have other beings dependent mm -hmm. on my success. And, and that's, a heavy, that's a heavy burden to carry. And I kept them all. And I actually hired someone during COVID, but it was a stretch financially to do that. Um, but I did it because I knew we had a, a gap in our organization and we needed to fill it to become, go to the next level. And so I did it. So I think the first thing is, you know, recognize the fear and and kind of be in it but i also think it's important to use that time as a gift you know if you're slow you don't want to stop marketing you want to keep that you know keep the conversations keep networking keep that going so that when things shift if it's an economic downturn for example if when things shift then then that stuff will come back in so you have to be careful about that but i think you know that's when i do product development or i do more writing or i you know, um, get more active on social media and things that I don't have time always. So use it as a gift. Last thing is, I think it's really important to keep our minds focused on the prize. And the prize is serving others and, and, and cementing your place in the world. And just keeping that, keeping your eye on the prize helps you get through a lot of fear. And, um, it's just really important to keep, you know, it's that true north, you know, keep focused on that true north. And, um, and then, you know, this is just a little woo woo, but um, manifest, you know, um, the world will give you what you ask for if you ask for it out of a place of purity and absolute clarity. <laughs> Absolutely. Karen, there's so, such a wonderful wonderful conversation and so many insights and great advice. And I know is going to give a lot of women the motivation and confidence to get started on their own entrepreneurship journey. 28 years, you are a pioneer woman in lead. You are a pioneer woman entrepreneur. So before we uh, let you go back to your super busy day and helping so many people, is there a few words you'd like to leave for people to think about and a little bit of information about some of the projects you're doing and uh, how people can contact you? Well, first of all, thank you for asking such great questions. That's what makes for a great conversation is really, really good questions. They were, they were wonderful. So thank you so much. Um, so I think, you know, I, I split my time between consulting and the academy and it, it varies from 60, 40 and both ways to 50, 50. Um, so right now we're starting to think ahead to 2022, getting our, our plan together on both fronts and on the academy front. Yeah, we're starting to think about some additional uh, learning learning means, pathways. Um, and so we're starting to think about that. That's very exciting. Um, and if you want, if anyone wants to connect with me, I'm on LinkedIn, you know, Karen Martin Opex is LinkedIn. Um, our two websites are the Academy is TKMG, remember the Karen Martin group, TKMGacademy.com. And the consulting is TKMG.com and they link together too. So you can go to one and get to the other. Um, and we have a lot of free resources on the Academy page as well under the resources tab. So look at that. And and then I want to, I need to hire two people. So I, <laughs> that's top of mind. We have two gaps now that we're growing. Um, we have two gaps that that's going to be my next thing. Totally cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. Thank you so much for inspiring so many over the years. And we will uh, see you soon 
at Women in Lean. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, thank you. That was wonderful. Really, really nice conversation, Karen. You are very welcome. I hope everyone gets you know something from it. Take a little pearl and apply it. Cool. And actually, that's going to just lead me into our next uh, last segment, which is to leave you with some of the key insights that Karen gave us in our conversation. So insight number one, work is... Uh, not the easiest we can do. Even with incredible people, you have to trust yourself and your mission. Understanding that not all tasks will be perfectly executed is also totally important. So um, work should give you joy. <laughs> work should make you happy and motivated. And if your current position doesn't make you feel that way, maybe entrepreneurship is for you. Insight number two, competence brings confidence. Com sorry, competence brings confidence, which brings result. And Karen, uh, let us know that coaches are super helpful. They can help you work on competencies because they are going to advise you directly. So think about getting a coach. Insight number three, individual meetings, daily meetings, and reports are ways to bring employees closer to the company's mission and purpose and align people and make them comfortable bringing their own ideas. So as an entrepreneur, we need to remember to use our own good lean principles in our company. Insight number four, ask people you trust as you plan so that they can help give you insights and advice and develop your ideas from their honest feedback. Make sure you trust the people that you're asking for advice. And insight number five, the client always <laughs> comes first. And this takes us right back to our basic lean principle of deeply understand each of your customers' needs. As business owners, we need to remember that our purpose, whatever kind of business we have, is always to serve our customers. It was a fabulous episode, wasn't it? Well, so that's actually it for this week's episode of Cultura G Excelencia. Thank you for joining me and Karen Martin today. And I'm going to be looking forward to seeing everyone next week where we're going to be talking about how to structure any company using lean concepts with more great women in lean. So until then, I hope you have a fabulous week filled with purpose, process improvement, and kindness. Bem pessoal, esse foi o oitavo episódio do Cultura de Excelencia. Muito obrigada por se juntar a mim e a Karen Martin hoje. Espero ver todos vocês na semana que vem, onde vamos falar sobre como estruturar qualquer empresa utilizando os conceitos lean, com mais uma mulher incrível no lean. Até lá, espero que você tenha uma semana fabulosa e cheia de propósitos, melhoria de processo e gentileza. Tchau, tchau!